Bonjour, bonjour. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, so, we are very happy with Isabelle uh, to start this cursus about uh, pacemaker, defibrillators, and electrophysiology. So, the concept will be every Monday at the same hour with the same link, uh, Zoom link, uh, you will have a teaching course every Monday uh, morning for uh, Canadians and at uh, noon for the Europeans. Uh, and it's going to be a cursus about, we're going to start, for example, today with um, pacemakers. So I think for at least three months, it's going to be about devices. So first pacemaker and then ICDs. Uh, we're going to see from the very beginning the basics of interrogation uh, of the different device to things a bit more complicated. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, devices from the different companies. Uh, today, for example, we're going to start with uh, pacemakers and Metronic pacemaker. We're going to see the basics of how to interrogate the different steps of interrogation of the dual chamber pacemaker. Uh, so, uh, Isabel, something special to say, to add? Uh, no, no, you're, you're doing this just fine. So we're <laughs> listening to you. Happy to see everybody connected this morning. Cool. Uh, so uh, once more, uh, we're going to start with three sessions about Medtronic pacemakers. The first one is going to be the basics of interrogation of a dual chamber pacemaker. Next time, we're going to discuss about how to program a patient with a pacemaker and sinus nose dysfunction. And the third one will be uh, about patients implanted with a dual chamber pacemaker and uh, atrioventricular block. And then we're going to have a cursus about uh, ABO devices and then Boston and then Biotronic and, and so on. And once we will have finished the pacemakers, we will do exactly the same uh, for the defibrillators. So let's start with this. So this is the first screen of a dual chamber pacemaker, uh, a patient implanted in Bordeaux. And we're going to see the different steps of interrogation. The point is that at one time I will interrogate someone and ideally I will do once a question for someone in Bordeaux and once uh, in someone in Quebec. So this is the very first screen when you arrive for interrogation of a pacemaker. The things that I usually do when I interrogate, the first thing that I do is, you know, you can click here on uh, what is written as patients. So if you click there, and then patient information, I think it's always interesting to know uh, what you're talking about and which kind of patient you will have the interrogation. So you will have here the main information. I think it's important when you do an implantation that you specify these all these information. So you will see the leads, uh, which kind of leads. It's important, of course, to know if it is unipolar or bipolar leads, for example. And you will see the time of implants. So, for example, here it was implanted in uh, 17, 2017. You can have some information on the, on the line. Sometimes it's important uh, to specify if there is something special, for example, in these patients, it's written that uh, this patient has demonstrated episode of uh, supraventricular tachycardia, and for example, that he received Xarelto is in French uh, an anticoagulant. So it's a medical therapy for the atrial fibrillation. You can see also that the very first device was implanted in 2001 with a change box in 2008, and then the, the last one in 2017. So I think it's always interesting to know who you are talking about, which kind of patients, and what kind of leads are connected to the pacemakers. So if you go back, then uh, if you click here on the checklist, usually I don't do it, but if you click on this, uh, if you really start, if you have never interrogated a pacemaker, there are uh, proposed by Medtronic uh, the different steps of interrogation. So have a look first to the parameters, the patient information, and then the test, the lean impedance. So you can follow these different steps. Well, 
Usually that's not the way we are doing it uh, right now. So if you come back to the first screen. Yes. Quick look. So the quick look here. So this is the very first screen. And you know, it's there are of course some differences from a company to the other one, but the idea is that on this screen you you need to have all the main information and all the links to, to get the different information during the interrogations. So if you start first, you know, here you have rem remaining longevity. So if you click there, that's what I do usually. Here are the informations. So this is a dual chamber pacemaker, Medtronic, and then you have uh, remaining longevity and there are three values. One is 8.9, one minimum is 7.9, and the other one maximum is 9.9. .9. So let's interrogate someone in France. Uh, 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 Clément Boiteux, are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, you are. And you speak perfectly English. I'll try to make myself understandable. Cool. Uh, so why do you have these three information? What does it mean? Uh, why not only one? There is an estimation. So, so you see there is the battery voltage, three volts. Yes. Initially, when you implant the device, it's three volts. And then you have the information here, RRT. It's going to be a tension of 2.63, so battery voltage of 2.63. But why are there three values there? Um, I guess uh, the, the estimated one was based on the uh, um, on the necessity for a stimulation of the, the, the how and um, how dependent the patient is. Okay. And, um, and minimum and maximum? Um, minimum. Uh, actually, I'm not really sure about those oh. two numbers. But... So the answer, you know, first of all, uh, when I do the interrogation of the device, usually I show the patients this information. I think it's very good for the patient to understand what we do. So I, I show him the different screens during, during the interrogation. So I will show... Uh, this information and explain to him that there are three values. It means that with the programming that you have today, with the percentage of pacing that you have today from the implantation, with the number of arrhythmia or anything like that, if nothing changes, the mean value for the duration will be 8.9. And it means that 95% of the device the duration will be more than 7.9 and less than 9.9. .9. You, you understand? If you do not change anything, yes. what it means is that you will have 95% of chance to have a device with a duration, a longevity of between 7.9 to 9.9. .9. Okay? Okay. So it's not a question of being dependent of if you have 100 of pacing or anything like that, or if you increase to the maximal amplitude of the device. No, it's with the programming that you have today and with the percentage of pacing that you have today, then you will have 95% of chance to have between 7.9 7 to 9.9. Okay? Okay, it's a confidence so, interval, basically. That's the first thing that uh, I, I, I look at. What, other thing that is important is you see here in red the RRT. What happens once it's uh, the duration enters the RRT when the the device is old and then you will need to change it. In terms of pacing, what happens? Does anybody know? It's important for each device when you will have to program the change of box you know, the, the replacement of the device, you need to know what happens exactly in terms of pacing. Does it change the way it is pacing once you have entered the RRT or not? So does, does anyone know what happens at this time? Anyone in Quebec, maybe? No, so it's Hello. important. Yes? Hello, it's Ian. Uh, in front. <laughs> I think when the pacemaker is in RRT, uh, the frequency would be at 65 on uh, magnets. Yes. Then three months later uh, in the ERI, 
it will uh, go into VVI mode uh, at uh, 65 frequency two, and then to EOS. I think it's that. Exactly. So that's perfect. That's yes. Once you enter the RRT, the programming is not changing at all. So it will remain in the parameters that you have programmed. So you have time uh, to, to organize uh, the replacement of the device. The only thing that will change once you enter the RRT is that the magnet frequency will change from 85 to 65. 65 is a number that you need to remember in Medtronic device. If you do a magnet test, then once you are in RRT, it will turn to 65, okay? But the, the programming, uh, the program parameters will not change during three months. If you wait for three months, that's what you have explained, then in permanence, you will be paced VVI 65. Okay, so you need to wait for three months before a change in. It's important because in some turn device, once you turn in RRT, then the programming will systematically change and then some patient may be symptomatic with that. So. Here, RRT for three months, no change in the programming. And after three months, you will uh, it will change to VVI 65. And if you wait three months more, then you arrive to the end of service. And then at this time, there is a high risk of uh, loss of pacing, loss of capture, and that may become very uh, difficult for the patient. Okay? So the very first step, as I explained, you look at the... Uh, remaining longevity. Then the, the next step is the sensing integrity counter. So you see here, short VV intervals. What does it mean? What, what is this exactly? Does anyone know what is this? And that's an important step. When you do the interrogation, it's very important when you do the interrogation of an ICD, but it is also important during a pacemaker. What is a short VV interval? is the detection of a VV interval, so interventricular interval, at the limit of the ventricular blanking. The ventricular blanking is 120 milliseconds. So if you have an interval of between two ventricles of 130 or 120, so 10 milliseconds more than the blanking that is programmed, then it will be recorded. And you will see the numbers of short VV intervals. That's important because that's... Uh, usually a sign for lead dysfunction. When you have a lead dysfunction, then uh, you, will, you may have a short VV interval. So when I do the interrogation, that's something that I look very carefully because if I see that there are some short VV intervals, then I will try to, to know why there are some short VV intervals. That can be lead dysfunction. That can be also oversensing of something, T wave or something, a P wave oversensing or this kind of thing. But that's something important. When it's zero, okay, maybe that the lead is functioning uh, correctly, okay? So in the same screen, the next one is atrial, atrial lead posi position check. Does anyone know what it is? Does anyone know? Nope, someone in France, in Canada. So maybe I can jump in for Quebec here. Yes. So, and please, guy, don't be shy. Honestly, I've been wrong many times during these sessions, and Pierre still haven't sent me back to Quebec. So we're all we here have hesitated. To learn some stuff. Yes. Sorry. We have hesitated many times, but <laughs> yeah. you're, you're still right. there. So the atrial lead, uh, well, the last, your last question was about uh, the yes, very- if you go back to the screen, please, the, the, the you, you see? Okay, sorry. Data. Yeah, of the, of the position of the atrial see lead. Here, atrial lead yeah. position check. Sometimes you see, yep. And it's really successful. So this is uh, at 2.45 uh, at night. Yes. Uh, the pacemaker will uh, pace with the atrial lead at high voltage. Um, to, and then there will be an analysis of the interval uh, with the ventricular detection to see if, for example, the atrial lead uh, has fall into the ventricle, something yes, like that. Exactly. So the first message here is that some patients come back and say, I am symptomatic at 
one specific moment of the day. For example, during the night, every day, uh, I'm walked, walked by something that happens at the level of my pacemaker. And depending on the kind of device uh, Medtronic, Abbott, or there, that's, there are some algorithms that may be effective just at one time of the day. And for example, during the night. For example, if you test the thresholds, automatically the threshold atrial and ventricular, for Medtronic, it's at 1 a.m. every morning during the night at 1 a.m. The sensing is at, at 2 a.m. and the impedance at 3. So sometimes if a patient says, okay, I, I feel something at 1 a.m. every day, I will have the idea that probably it's the automatic threshold. So I will see if I program or deprogram the automatic threshold, but in some patient, it can be symptomatic. This one, may be symptomatic for some patients. The atrial lead position check, the idea is to pace with high voltage, the atrial lead. So it's gonna be six volts and 1.5 milliseconds for five beats every night at 2.45. So if a patient says, okay, I'm symptomatic at 2.45 uh, every day, I will be sure that this is this algorithm, okay? And the idea is to, you know that with Medtronic device now, you have the possibility with Medtronic pacemakers to pace the atrium to reduce the episode of atrial fibrillation. And you pace with very high rate. So the catastrophic situation will be that the atrial lead has fallen inside the ventricle, and then you pace very fast with your atrial lead, but you pace the ventricle. You may induce ventricular fibrillation. That's why there is always a verification in this algorithm. You see? So uh, if you show now, if you close, please, and show now where it is, where you program it. You see, if you go on parameters, and then here in atrial fibrillation, you see, here, if you click, you see that here it's not programmed in this patient, but you could pr program ATP or pacing, very fast pacing, to try to reduce the episode of atrial fibrillation. Here it's off, but you see here that there is the lead suspect here, it's on on. If you want to deprogram it, that's where you will have to put it on off. Okay? So remember that in this patient, every night it will be paced with five bits at very high amplitude. And some patients are really symptomatic about that, okay? So that's just an example to think that if a patient says that he is symptomatic every day at the same hour, you need to think that it is maybe something specific inside the pacemaker. So if you come back to the screen, then once you have a look at it, so the longevity, the VV, and then the atrial check, I come back to this screen. On this screen on the left, you will have the information about the leads, okay? So if you click on this, you can have first, you see on the right, last measurements. Last measurements, you will have all the last measurements, automatic measurements for the actual lead and the RV lead. And you will see also the program parameters corresponding to what you have tested. So for example, uh, the question is every time, if you come back to the last measurements, please. Last, yes. Uh, I will not systematically redo all the measurements, you know, when there are some automatic measurements. For example, the impedance. This is the impedance that has been measured the same day at 2 a.m. Uh, I will not redo systematically the measurements of the impedance. For the... I think Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sorry. So now if you click on, on the curve, on the impedance, for example, you see ends on uni and B, please. Okay. So for all the different measurements, impedance, sensing, thresholds, what you see here, you see the dots, you have the exact value of the last 15 days. Okay. And what, if you look at the impedance, the things that we'll look at is, are there abnormal values and are there any changes, you know, brutal changes in the values? So you can see here 
the last 15 days. And then you can see up to 60 weeks with the minimal value and the maximal value and the mean value for the impedance. Okay? So here, for example, you can see that the impedance are stable and there's no uh, abnormal value. So you can see for the atrial and for the right ventricular impedance. Okay? If you do now have a look to the sensing. So the amplitude, you will have the same. So the exact value for the 15 last days, and then you see the curve for 60 weeks. Anytime you will see the mean value and the maximal value of the week and the minimal value of the week, okay? And you can see here also that it is pretty stable. Now, if you look at the thresholds, So it's important to know how it works. We will see it in the, the next, uh, next courses on how it works, the automatic thresholds. But you see here that this patient has a high threshold, for example. And it will do automatic measurements of the, the right ventricular and atrial threshold every night at 1 a.m. And if the threshold, the threshold is measured with a duration of 0.4 milliseconds. And if it is more than 2.5 volts at 0.4 milliseconds, it will appear like this. It is at the limit of what is measured. And it will say, this is a high threshold, okay? Any question on that? And you will have the same for the atrial, okay? So now if you, okay, if you click on parameters, you will see that in this patient, and if you click on uh, amplitude, you see that in this patient, the atrial threshold is completely correct. And what is programmed is adaptive. It means that it will do the measurements and it will adapt the amplitude. And now, if you look on the RV, you, as you have seen, the threshold is high. And you see that it is programmed on monitor. It means that it will do systematically the threshold every night at 1 a.m., but without adaptation. It's going to be a fixed amplitude. If you want to program adaptive, then you will not need to program adaptive, you see. But when you have this kind of high threshold, it may be difficult. Okay? Any question on that? So if you come back to the screen, quick look. See? Then... You will go on the right side of the screen and on top you have the main parameters what is program i ddd we will see that so it's the mvp mode this mode has been promoted to decrease as much as possible the amount of uh, avoidable right ventricular pacing so this is a patient with sinus dysfunction so one of the aim of the programming will be to decrease as much as possible the percentage of uh, inappropriate, I will say, right ventricular pacing. Then you have the percentage of pacing. In these patients, you can see that uh, it's MVP, and we will have a look then after on the percentage. So it's essentially based on the atrial and not on the ventricle. Uh, you will see uh, the episode of atrial fibrillation and arrhythmia. So the next step, I will say at this time, is to have a look to the cardiac compass. See cardiac compass here? So first of all, you have on top uh, these markers, I and P. What does it mean? Does anyone know? What is this? I underline and P. Anyone knows? Nope. Uh, 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 uh. Camille Strube, are you there? Uh, yes. <laughs> what do uh, you think? I assume it's uh, written on the side, so it's session when you interrogate. If it's underlined, it's uh, interrogated by uh, telecardiology. Exactly, it's remote, yes, it's remote telecardiology. And P means that you have done uh, the P, a physical interrogation, so with the programmer, and then that you have modified something, that you have reprogrammed something, okay? So in this patient, for example, 
you see that there is a i every three months you see and that there is one additional one you see here in between so this one is a bit surprising because in, in uh, bordeaux what we do is that if the patient and most of the patient are followed with remote monitoring then we will do a systematic complete interrogation of the device every three months so this is our these are these i with underline every three months but there is an additional one and this corresponds to an alert so if you show us if you want to see the alerts that's not to be a permit the different alerts no if you want to check if there have been some alerts with remote monitoring here it's going to be here you see you see that there was an alert you can see when there was some alerts with remote monitoring and you can see the date here it was on october you see uh, and that corresponds to this one it's clear for everybody if you want to check if there has been some alert with remote monitoring you need to go on data and then on care alert events that's where it is okay so if you come back to the screen now one thing also important is about remote monitoring if uh, when if you want to start remote monitoring then you will go on parameters parameters please up and then yes initially the alerts that are programmed with systematically programmed and nominally programmed with remote monitoring are the technical ones you see the three on the on the lowest three so low battery lead impedance and cap tube management these three are on nominally if you want to follow a patient with atrial fibrillation then you need to program it because initially nominally on the pacemaker it, the, these alerts are off okay so this patient had a problem of atrial fibrillation so that's an information that we wanted to receive with some alerts so you need to program it on on okay remember that nominally the only alerts that are programmed are the ones the technical not the clinical the clinical like for example atrial fibrillation you need to program it okay okay so you come back to the screen any question or something like that nope so then you will have a look to this so you understand there has been remote monitoring there has been an alert there the, the last interrogation physical with programming was in october and then you have a look and you see that in this patient obviously there has been some episodes of uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation of course you will need to check you will have a look to the different tracing because like this you need to check that the information is real when there are many very short episodes that can be a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation but that can be also problems of over sensing or something like that so you really need to check them before uh, considering that this is true you need to check on the tracing that this is real uh, atrial fibrillation okay uh, uh you can see the percentage of pacing and you will see for example that this patient is some it's a sinus dysfunction so it's paced sometimes in the atrium and the percentage is really minimum at the level of the ventricle what is expected in this patient with sinus dysfunction and the mvp mode okay the activity is also important and interesting to look uh yes you see somewhere here this patient has been uh, received surgery uh, at the level of the eye that's why there is a decrease in the activity when you have this kind of curse most of the time you can explain what there has been this situation any question on that nope so now you will have a look to the rate histograms the rate histograms uh, so you will see these two curves this one is from the last interrogation from the last session so as i said it was in october uh, 2021 and then before uh, these are the values the, the from the interrogation before i don't know if it's very clear but from february to september see in these patients uh, the results are expected it's a patient with sinus node dysfunction so uh, without uh, without sensor when he's in sinus rhythm so uh, you see here that it will be paced at the minimal r rate program 
60, and then for all the, its uh, spontaneous activations, its spontaneous rhythm, and you see that there is a clear acceleration within sinus. So this is clearly acceptable. If you look at the ventricle now, most of the time is sensed, nearly 100% of sensing, which is expected in this patient with sinus node dysfunction and episode of atrial fibrillation. So when he is in sinus, he is paced at the level of the atrium with spontaneous ventricle. And when he is atrial fibrillation, there's a spontaneous conduction with also a spontaneous ventricular conduction. Uh, okay. Now you will check what has been recorded in terms of episode of arrhythmia. If you have a look. Up. So, uh, on this, you will have, uh, if you come back, if you close it, please. Okay, you, you can have three kinds of informations, VTVF, ATAF, and fast AV. Usually I look first, I will start with ATAF. So I will click on this ATAF and we will have a look to the episodes. So if you open it. So, okay. If you magnify it a little, if you click there, you can see here. The first thing that we have a look is the plot. So in blue are the actual intervals. In uh, purple, you will have the ventricular intervals. So first, you are synchronized with atrial ventricular, and then a clear acceleration at the level of the atrium, and then something like a classical response at the level of ventricle with atrial fibrillation, something very, very irregular. Okay, if you look at the EGM, so you see that, uh, First of all, initially at the episodes, you only have the markers. I will show you how to program it, but you see the markers. Initially, you are paced at the level of the atrium, at the atrium with a ventricular conduction, and then probably a pack, uh, premature atrial contraction, and then the onset of an episode of atrial fibrillation. It's very difficult to say that if this is real, so you will see the whole episode, and then it will have access uh, to the EGMs, and you see here, the quality of the EGM is not perfect. I think it's really imperfect here, but obviously it seems to be real signals. So really atrial fibrillation with irregular response at the level of the ventricle. And then if you go to the end, you will see at one time the spontaneous reduction. So that's clearly uh, a, a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with the reduction Okay, you have the whole episode. So the question here is, which kind, it's very important when you do the interrogation, which kind of EGM you want to see and at what time you want to see them. So if you go to the programming, so data collection setup, if you click on this, then you can choose which kind of EGM you want to see. So you have three possibilities. EGM 1, 2, and 3. But at the end, you need to remember that if you close it, close, please. If you click on monitored, then you will have the possibility to see only two EGM. So for example, in the tracing that I've shown you, you have two EGM like this, A tip to A ring. So it's bipolar atrial EGM. RV tip to RV ring is the bipolar also ventricular EGM. And you will see all these two. Something that you may modify is the range at the level of the atrium. You see here, it's plus or minus eight millivolt. And as I explained, most of the time, the quality is intermediate with this kind of range. In this patient, for example, you see that the atrial signals are very small, very difficult to analyze. And I will change the rate, for example, to the four millivolt. And I know that many physicians systematically uh, will change it at the, uh, the implantation and program systematically at the level of the atrium for millivolt. Okay. Okay. So if you close it. Ah, no, come back, please. Yes, you show me. But one of the questions you see sometimes it's very important for the ICDs, but it's also important for the pacemaker. 
if you program it like this, it's going to be changed in the new devices. But at least for all these devices, nominally, you will not see the EGM before the arrhythmia and for the very first EGM during the onset of the tachycardia. And sometimes it's very important to, to see the EGM to understand what happens exactly. So you can program it on on, but nominally it's off. It means that you will see the EGM after the onset of the arrhythmia and not before and just at the onset. So the, the thing is that if you program it like that, it will increase, I will say, quite considerably uh, the consumption for the device. It will decrease the longevity of the battery. And it's not trivial. It can be important in some patients. For example, in this patient with many episodes of atrial fibrillation, if you require to see the all EGM, it, it will have a cost, it means, in terms of consumption of the battery. Okay? So in this patient, for example, I will not change it systematically and I will remain on off. Okay? So you can close. So uh, for the interrogation, I think that we have seen, you, there are some ops. So yes, uh, if you come back to the arrhythmia, so if you unclick VTVF and ITAF, you can ask also to see the fast AV. Fast AV. You see, it's important to know this patient, you know that they have an uh, episode of atrial fibrillation. What is the maximal rate in terms of ventricle? You can see the episode with fast ventricular rhythm. For example, here, you see that sometimes uh, this patient with atrial fibrillation will have very fast episode at the level of ventricle. And if this patient has heart failure or something like that, maybe that's a point which is important to know if you need to increase the treatment in terms of beta blockers, for example. So that's something also that you will have to check systematically. Okay, you can close. And at the end, you will have to look to the VTVF in terms of episodes. If you come back to the monitor episode. The VTVF in these patients, um, the, the discrimination is not as important as in an ICD. Yeah? because at the end, there's no therapy. So here, to discriminate between AF and VT, the only thing that will do the device is to compare the actual rate to the ventricular rate. So in this patient, for example, there was no real episode of VT. It was an uh, episode of atrial fibrillation that were, there was a mistake at the level of the diagnosis. It was considered at VT because there was at some time a certain level of atrial undersensing. And if there is initially at the initiation of the episode, under sensing at the level of the atrium, the ventricle will be faster than the, the, the atrium, and then it will be considered as a uh, ventricular tachycardia. Okay? You can close now. Uh, so I think that at this time you have most information. One thing that you can check also in these patients you have programmed the MVP, so A-A-I-D-D-D. -D -D. Uh, you can check if you go on, you see it's programmed A-A-I-D-D-D. -D -D. Uh, you know that in some devices, there is the possibility to record an EGM anytime uh, the patient will turn from A-A-I to D-D-D. -D -D. So there's going to be a recording of the of an EGM to verify that it corresponded to a real episode of atrial ventricular block. Here in Medtronic, you do not have an EGM. The only thing that you can have is on clinical diagnostic, diagnostics, and you will see the MVP mode switches. So you will not see an EGM, but you will know how many of this, and at what time there was a, a, there was a, a switch from AI to DDD. You will not have the possibility, but that's something which is important in patients with sinus dysfunction. Okay, if you close, then go back to the screen, please. Up, I think that you have checked now what is the most important, I think, for these patients. The only thing then you will come back to the test now, if you click on test. So obviously, uh, I will not redo systematic, uh, maybe we should, but that's, that's not something that we do systematically. If uh, the impedance, for example, if you have a curve like this, and then the impedance had, has been measured this, the same day in the morning, it's not, it's not very logical to redo it systematically during the interrogation. Uh, 
The only thing that we will redo in this patient for sure is the ventricular threshold uh, because there was a high threshold, automatic threshold. Here in Medtronic, you do not have the possibility to redo during the consultation an automatic measurement of the threshold. You know that it can be either automatic or you do it manually, okay? It's not possible with Medtronic that during the interrogation, you redo an automatic measurement to verify that it works correctly. The only thing that you can do is a manual test. And then in this patient, for example, you will redo the test. So in this patient with sinus node dysfunction, usually I program the DDD, I increase the rate like this, and I decrease, no, not VVI, DDD, DDD. I will program a short AV delay. You see, very short, yes, like this, to be sure that you capture that there's not a spontaneous conduction. And then I will do the test and verify. The other option, as you have shown, is to program VVI 90 bits per minute and knows if there is a capture or not. For the atrial thresholds, if the patient is like this, usually I program AAI. And then I do the test, and if you lose the actual capture, then there was no will not be any spontaneous conduction, entrancing conduction. So anytime you lose the R wave, that's because you have lost the capture at the level of the atrium. Okay. So in this patient, for example, I will reduce systematically the two thresholds. Do you have any? Very, be yes? very careful eh, not to do this in a patient known with uh, a V block. Yes, if you program AAI uh, in a patient with AV block, that can be a problem, yes. But you will see it very, very quickly. After a few seconds, I think. After a few seconds, you will see that there is some there is a problem and the patient may say it. Okay. Uh, Marcus, Mark, do yeah. you have... Something. So no, just uh, you you showed for the remote monitoring that there is a, a parameter, and those parameters are automatically switched on. And uh, as you said in in Bordeaux, we follow follow all patients. We try to follow all of those patients uh, through remote monitoring. But I know that in many centers uh, this is not the case, and we can discuss about this a very long time. We think it's it's a very good idea to, to do remote monitoring also for pacemaker patients. But if you decide not to do it, I think it's important to know that it's automatically switched on and that it should be switched off if you want to save quite some significant time of uh, battery life, uh, at least a few months. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's very important, as you say. Yeah. I see that some patients in some centers, there's no remote monitoring for pacemakers and the, the, the function for remote monitoring is on. And if you let it on, you will increase the consumption. So nominally, nominally it's on. So you need to put it off systematically. Okay. Yeah. Something else, Mark? Uh, no. Something that you particularly, particularly appreciate in this kind of device or that you don't like? Uh, no, up until now, I think it's a very, uh, a very basic. I think I like, I really like to see those, those mode switches from, uh, AI to DDD. So I like that in some other companies. Uh, I think, uh, this little trick, which you showed us that there is a list showing us that there are some mode switches at what time. I think that's very interesting. So you at least have some information. Uh, but uh, that that's that's the only thing I would uh, I would be missing uh, in these devices. And as uh, you said, the saving of the EGM. Eh? So for Medtronic, it's three parts. It's before the detection of the arrhythmia; those are only markers. Then there is a small part of the beginning of the detection, and then there's the the, the end, and yeah. where we have the the tracing. Uh, and I rarely change this actually. Uh, even though we're used to this, to seeing all this information in other companies, uh, the, 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 the truth is that most often we can make a very good diagnosis using only the markers in the beginning and then the EGM after the detection of the arrhythmia. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, Hugo Pierre, something? Hugo Pierre that has been renamed Plancha. Yeah. If you don't no, mind, uh, in Quebec, I would like him to call him Plancha. If you don't, if you don't mind, I have nothing to add. No. Nothing, Isabel. 
I know. Maybe I just had a question, Pierre. Sometimes when we look at the um, the the rate uh, histogram, yes. Well, um, sometimes I, you know, most of the time we use this information to see if there is adequate um, chronotropic function, like adequate acceleration when mm -hmm. when patient activates. But sometimes I also use these uh, these histograms to see if there is arrhythmia that would be under detection of the um, sure. EGM collection for, for the arrhythmia. And do you actually know how many intervals is needed in, in one uh, heart rate in order to have a little line appearing on the histogram? Because I'm asking you the question because I don't know myself. I don't know. The only thing I know is that every rate is calculated on the mean value of nine bits, you see? So it's a mean value of, but I don't know, uh, I understand. To have information, for example, with fast, how many? No, I don't know. Um, well, it, it's a question it, it, of percentage, it, but I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it's a prop, then it's probably approximately nine or 10 beats then, because it, it would not pick up um, like a PVC. Nope come short after because that would be only one interval and we'd see it, it mm -hmm. would be all over the place. So, okay. Well, probably, probably it's about that range, about nine, nine or 10 in order to have a little line then yeah. with what you said. To be considered at one time, I know that it's a minimum of nine bits. You see, the rate must be a minimum, but uh, to, to see it uh, at the end, I don't know. I don't know. Great. Well, that was a great overview of, yeah. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, any questions from the audience? Do not hesitate. No? Okay. Uh, so what I could propose, if you agree, that next Monday, uh, we'll try to define then uh, how to... You see, it's very basic. Huh? Very, you, you st we start with the beginning, but uh, how to program a patient, a typical patient with sinus node dysfunctions, uh, different parameters, what is important to have a look during the interrogation, and how you, you program it. Okay? Okay for everybody. Same time, same place? Same time, same place, next Monday. Okay? Bye-bye. All right. See you Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.